Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. This is part of the 1M by 1M Global Virtual Accelerator. Our mission is to have a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these roundtables, free mentoring roundtables, week after week after week. This is the 593rd session. It's been going on for a very long time since 2008. So we have recordings of every single event available on our YouTube channel. You're very welcome to check it out. On Twitter, we're at 1M by 1M and at Stromana, hashtag for today is 1M 1M. This is a roundtable, not a broadcast. We have scheduled programming first, but after that we will be open to conversations. Today, we're going to start the conversation with Giuseppe Don Vito, partner at P101 Ventures. Giuseppe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Giuseppe, let's start by introducing our audience to you uh, and get acquainted ourselves as well. Tell us a bit about your background as well as about the fund. Sure. Thank you, Shermana. Um, Giuseppe Don Vito, partner at P101. Uh, I've been in the venture capital and private equity industry for more than 20 years. I have a Master of Science degree in telecommunication engineering, and then I have uh, an MBA uh, in finance, and plus an advanced executive course at the Northwestern University in Chicago as well. Um, I, I joined one of the largest venture capital groups in 2000 called 3i group plc between milan and london and then let's say across my career i worked also at hsbc between london and the middle east working on the principal investment side and then since 2014 i'm a senior partner at p101 p101 is one of the largest italian venture capital fund even though we also invest outside of italy as long as we find some let's say value adding angle uh, we do mainly Series A or pre-Series B. Our targets are basically startups that should have at least 1 million euro ARR, so annual recurring revenue. Um, as I said, located in Italy or even outside of Italy, as long as we find some, let's say, either Italian angle or angles um, whereby we think we can add value like they want to set up something in Italy or we know very well the specific sector uh, and so forth so on. Um, our typical equity ticket goes let's say between three and five million euro as the initial ticket and then we can go up to let's say 10 million following the, the rounds. We cover mainly what we call the digital and information technology sectors so basically it's both B2C and B2B. So if you look at our portfolio, we range from e-commerce to software as a service, fintech, cybersecurity, uh, prop tech, and so forth and so on. Um, what else? The fund, basically, uh, we are in the process of launching the third fund. They should target in excess of 150, 160 million euro. We already uh, raised uh, two funds in the previous nine years. Uh, the first fund is basically nearly at the end of the period, and then the second fund, we just closed the, the investment period. We did more than 50 deals in our history uh, with several exits. So overall, let's say in terms of return, the fund is doing well. Um, yeah, basically this is where we are in terms of funds. Wonderful introduction. Giuseppe, I want to um tap into your expertise and uh, help our audience understand uh, and myself also understand the current status of the Italian startup ecosystem. Um, what are the dynamics? How big is the ecosystem? How many startups are you know, in the IT and IT enabled services sector, the sector that you focus on and we focus on? Um, how big is it? How many startups are there? And uh, you know, what, where are they located in, within Italy, et cetera? Absolutely. I would say, Shamana, this is a very interesting period for the Italian mm -hmm. ecosystem um, because it's a relatively 
I would say young ecosystem. When I say young, it means that compared to other um, European, because I don't want to mention the US because it's significantly more advanced countries, we started, we restarted after the famous internet bubble in 2000, a little bit later. And uh, we are now catching up. Uh, of course, we are not probably at the same level as other ecosystem like France or the UK, but there are many positive trends. I would say the first one is, uh, at least so far, we have not seen significant excess in terms of valuation or, let's say, inflating system or sectors. We are still, in my opinion, in a fair environment, both in terms mm -hmm. of valuation and in terms of business. Um, the country has always had, um, let's say, solid technological uh, background, both in terms of university and in terms of, let's say, talent pools or talent skills that you can leverage on. Um, it's quite, let's say, focused or geographically concentrated in the Milan area, even though you can find other interesting I would say uh, areas like around Rome or Bologna. Or, let's say it's quite, it's, it's not really super focused on Milan, but you can find uh, interesting areas also outside Milan. <clears throat> In terms of numbers, I, I would not mention the number of startups. I think it's, it's more interesting to mention that this year, 2022, uh, we will reach roughly 2 billion euro investments into the venture capital world in Italy. And bear in mind that last year was 1 billion. So there was a sort of, sort of doubling the size. That is a very encouraging sign in terms of, of both, let's say, fundraising at the venture capital level and also, you know, in terms of downstream let's say, money put in the, in the startup world. And this is pretty much across digital, medtech, biotech, and advanced materials. So we have other, um, other subsectors. Um, the venture capital scene, um, let's say, at the moment includes more than 20 uh, VCs. So you can find, let's say, uh, capital. Of course, we still need probably some fill the gap into the value chain, uh, you know, late stage, uh, sometimes at seed stage. So we are seeing also an increased interest from uh, international VCs or pr private equity into our world. And this is probably, in my opinion, the more consistent sign that the market is interesting in terms of, as I said, valuation and potential upside. So I would define a, a growing ecosystem with significant upside. So I have a number of questions based on what you said and, and, and a few comments as well. Firstly, uh, what is the size of your deal flow in a given year? How many uh, deals do you see? Yeah, basically on average, I would say given we, when we started as a P101, we used to do a mix of post seed and early stage. So we used to see on average 1000 uh, companies per year, out okay. of which, as you can imagine, our investment rate was like five per year. Yep. Now that we moved a little bit more late in terms of stage. So as I said, we don't do usually targets below 1 million ARR. I would say we see roughly 500, 600 portfolios, sorry, 600, 500 deals per year. And again, we do only 1%, like five per year. So yeah, this is the kind of size. Then as usual in those typical uh, stats, you have, I don't know, 50% that probably we don't explore and the remaining 50%, we, we do some, let's say, analysis until we get probably up to 20 on yeah. which we do a due diligence and then we do five. That's a very encouraging number. If you have 500 companies that are coming to you that have 1 million ARR, that's a very, very robust development. No, I mean, Romana, to be honest, they probably they don't have all the 1 million ARR, I would say in general, 
sometimes you know they they come to us and they have uh, even a little bit less but in my opinion is also encouraging yeah it's encouraging definitely you know uh, you would appreciate this i uh, more than 20 years ago i worked on the turnaround of an italian company that had raised money in the US. you will probably be aware of the company called Pink3 out of University of Bologna. Yeah. Are you familiar with them? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and Joe no, was the CEO and uh, yeah. So anyway, it was a very interesting experience at the time. I don't think there were that many companies raising money in Silicon Valley from Italy. And, uh, and uh, so it was, it gave me a window into what's happening in Italy, at least in one sector. And, uh, mm. Um, anyway, so that's just a, an aside. But coming back to um, my question, though, it's um, is it around the university towns? Is, is it around Milan, Bologna, Rome? Because of because those have big universities, or is it because they have big employers? No, I mean it's uh, as you know in venture capital. It's always the ecosystem that has to work all together. So it's a mix of elements and things. So I would say, first of all, as it is proven also in other, you know, ecosystem, um, usually it's around the financial district. So Milan is the financial district of Italy. So you can find uh, venture capital, private equity, banks, corporation. You can find talent. I mean, employees, because, you know, this is, in my opinion, the real issue at the moment, probably for the entire venture capital world, is to find the right people, you know, in the, in the startups. So usually in the big, big cities like Milan, you can find relatively easier. And at the same time, you know, it may be because you have uh, all around uh, services, you know, it can be like the public notaries, uh, tax auditors, account advisors. So there is this kind of concentration uh, in a specific area. Mm, okay. You know, your comment about the stage of funds, uh, it doesn't worry me hugely that the later stage fund e ecosystem is not as present yet in Italy. It will come, besides, if, if a company has gotten to a certain level of maturity with local uh, funding, then you have pan-European funds that will come to the later stages. Even American funds will come to the later stages. Today, investment is global. You know, American VCs invest everywhere, and uh, and there are a lot of funds out of London, in particular, uh, Berlin, uh, and so on, who will invest in in companies that are Series B, Series C, Series D companies. So, I think your the gap you see in the later stage ecosystem can easily be bridged for the moment. It should be no yeah. problem. Yeah. No, no, this um, is quite interesting. Let's uh, talk about some of your, uh, you know, case studies of companies that you've invested in. And as you are uh, describing some of these, please talk about how you discovered them, how they came to you or how you found them, and what state were they in when you found them, and what was it about them that caught your attention and and you decided to write the check. Yeah, um, I can mention one of the, let's say, companies that we still have in our portfolio. Um, that is a fintech company. And the reason why I'm mentioning is because, first of all, I follow directly the company I'm sitting in the board. And at the same time, the company is performing, let's say, very, very well. Um, that is called OPIN, O-P-Y-N. Is um, one of the leading Southern European embedded finance companies. So it's uh, you know in this kind of sector, and uh, we invested in this company five years ago. Um, they came to us, and this is a good, let's say, positive for us because you know they uh, thought uh, the P101 had, let's say, some experience and could help the company. Uh, both in terms of growing the company and because we knew the sector that was fintech. Um, mm -hmm. So, and uh, so, you know, the typical situation, uh, they showed us, you know, the pitch deck, we, we met the management team and we basically always, you know, apply when we analyze a company, 
uh, our, let's say, proprietary framework that is not so different from other VCs, but we are obsessed by the quality of the founding and the management team. So mm -hmm. this is probably the main point for us. And this was the case for Open where, you know, we thought the management team, both in terms of background, in terms of skill set, in terms of, you know, uh, other soft skills, they could be the right management, let's say, for, uh, for this kind of company, for this kind of deal. At the same time, of course, given our knowledge of the fintech sector, we thought that the company had significant improvement for, you know, uh, growth. And as, it, as the company proved, uh, let's say, in the last uh, five years, first of all, because they became the, as I said, Italian, of course, and one of the largest in Europe in terms of embedded finance. But at the same time, they were always able to, let's say, navigate the ups and downs, because as you know, uh, let's say it, can, it cannot be always positive no, in the life of a startup and what the management and the team that they built, sorry, because the founding team, then they built a resilient, I would say, top management team. They were always able, even in difficult moments and difficult times, to find the solution. And let's mm -hmm. say, first of all, they proved to be resilient as a person and at the same mm -hmm. time, you know, always finding new, new ideas. Um, so it, it, we are, as you can imagine, we, we are, uh, let's say, we are expecting big things uh, from this company in the future in terms of exit or whatever it would be. Um, so this company really, we also helped the company in terms of introduction of new customers. We are always, let's say, present in terms of uh, supporting the management. Um, you know, sometimes we help in business development, hiring, M&A. So it's a, it's a very interesting case we have in our portfolio. And this is from Southern Italy? No, this is from Milan. Milan, okay. And, and what specifically in FinTech? Is it a lender? Is it a B2C they lender, B2B started... lender? No, yeah, they started as a, let's say, uh, matchmaking lending for SMEs. So basically okay. they raised money from either private, retail, and uh, let's say institutional, and they developed an algorithm. So there is, of course, some software running behind uh, using big data, artificial intelligence, and so forth, so on. Um, that helped, let's say, the matching between lender and borrowers. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, so it, then they raised also some credit funds aside. But then yeah. what we realized at a certain point, I mean, the management realized at a certain point, is that the real value of the company was the software, was the tech. So then slowly they repositioned the company towards the lending as a service or platform as a service. So providing the tech stack to financial institutions like asset management, banks, uh, corporates for the so-called supply chain financing. Mm -hmm. So it is what we are doing right now. So it's a lending as a service platform where we can help, as we say, financial institution companies to lend even to their supply chain using, let's say, big data or advanced credit score or credit rating algorithm. Um, basically, we are complementing the, the banking system, the lending, yeah. the traditional lending into those segments that the banks, in my opinion, either they can do or they don't want to do for profitability reasons. Mm -hmm. So we are filling this, uh, let's say, huge gap. And then, of course, we are now, given we have the lending, we have the software, we are now entering new sectors of the so-called embedded finance you know, uh, system and the company is generating in excess of you know, 40, 50 million euro revenues at the moment. And this is market-wise, uh, the company is catering to all of Europe, not just Italy, yeah? At the moment it's just Italy, but of course we are considering now an expansion so outside. It's generating 40, 50 million dollar euro a year just yeah. in Italy. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. With the BDA positive. That is the other fantastic point. Yeah, that's awesome. Now you mentioned exit. Um, tell me a bit about what's happening in Italy in the tech sector vis-a-vis -vis exit. Have you started seeing exits? What kind of exits are happening? What's your 
analysis of exit? Absolutely. I would say, if you don't mind, Tramana, I'll mention two things. One is, let's call it unicorn, even if I don't like the concept, yeah. because, you know, in, in my opinion, sometimes it's just a definition. Uh, and exit, whereas we like exit because, you know, first of all, is tangible. Exit and is second... real. Unicorn can be a myth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you never, you never, you know, I defined, it's my personal <laughs> definition, you have... Uh, liquid unicorn and illiquid unicorn so okay. the liquid unicorn it's something that you really happened but you say it very like, politely i say it real unicorns and fake unicorns <laughs> yeah i don't want to go let's say there no i think this is the other typical evolution of an ecosystem you know so in italy we are seeing the same steps as you could see in the past in other more advanced ecosystem so first of all, we are finally generating unicorns. There are a couple of cases that we can mention. And uh, as, uh, as we said, they are, let's say, the 1 billion you know, plus uh, valuation company. But, and this is the real positive of this ecosystem, in the last five, six years, and P101 has been one of the main players, we generated exit and we, you know, that from one side, we gave back, you know, money to our investors that this means that the system is working. On the other side, we are also proving that these companies, especially on the venture and the tech side, in some cases, we don't need 20 years to realize, you know, so we can find the right balance to some extent. So I can mention, let's say, several exit, not just in our portfolio, but also in other VCs portfolios. In some, they were really successful, successful exits, uh, national, international, B2C, B2B. What I found very interesting, and this is something we apply ourselves at P101, is, you know, as a VC or as a manager of a fund, you always need to be, let's say, clever to find the right time. This is, this yeah. is key, in my opinion, Maureen, because otherwise it's easy to say, okay, I can keep this company for... 10 years, say, okay, but, you know, sometimes you need to understand where is the right moment. And at least in our case, we were, let's say, able to find the right moment. Uh, I don't want to deny that in some cases, if we had not sold the company at that time, let's say now the company would not exist <laughs> because of other reasons. So you need to be, in my opinion, good. So the ecosystem also from the exit point of view, going back to your question, is evolving and in, there will be more and more in the in the coming years. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the themes that I am hearing from a lot of people um, is that this whole unicorn mania is an opportunity for funds that don't want to play in that to exit into. So if there are, you know, other unicorns that are raising huge amounts of money and you know, they have to backfill the valuation, basically. So if you have a company that has good fundamentals, these kinds of companies are good exit opportunities. They're flushed with capital, but they don't have the fundamentals, and they're looking for companies that can strengthen their fundamentals. These are actually very good exit opportunities. Yeah. So um, where, how do you see the... Italian ecosystem emerging in terms of sector trends. FinTech, you have a very robust company that is doing 40, 50 million dollars already within just selling into the Italian market. Um, are there other parts of the FinTech sector where there is, there are, there's a lot of activity? Where is the, where is the core competency of the Italian ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, very good question, Maureen. In my opinion, we can play, let's say, always, sorry, talking about digital and ICT, that is my sector. Uh, I would say that I can see several trends. One is fintech. Uh, we have seen also cybersecurity, let's say not mm -hmm. at a high level, but let's say that the Italian universities or in general, the Italian tech ecosystem, in my opinion, has got very interesting skills to succeed both in fintech and cybersecurity. But I would mm -hmm. say in general, 
uh, also on the consumer side, uh, let's call it e-commerce or marketplace, uh, given the nature of the Italian economy, you know, in some cases uh, has been driven by purely consumer or luxury goods related, all the digital around these sectors, um, in my opinion, has got very good potential. Uh, what I've seen happening in the last three or four years is the flourishing of the B2B. So always also the enterprise software. Because, you know, mm -hmm. in the past, we were more perceived as a country, more on the consumer side, you know, because of the food, fashion, whatever. But it's not just that. And in my opinion, the, you know, uh, growing VC ecosystem is basically feeding and sourcing more of these enterprise software. Mm -hmm. So even going around, you know, sometimes I do for passion universities or talking to researcher PhD, I can see that this project, they have very huge potential. Let's call it even deep tech. So you know, I'm talking okay. from hardware to, to software. In my opinion, let's say we will be you know, at the same level as other European countries with the balanced mix between B2C and B2B. FinTech has always been interesting here in Italy in any, let's say, uh, subsector, so payments, lending, uh, even supply chain in the banking system, you know, let's call it compliance as a service, risk as a service. Because, you know, the Italian banking system is quite, let's say, robust, has never been mm -hmm. really exposed to, you know, big turbulence. So I can see also some, let's say, idea of the old banking system to rejuvenate themselves. And sometimes mm -hmm. they really start the some fintech companies by themselves and they opening they're opening the you know the uh, the cap table to to vcs like us interesting it's uh, you know italy has this long tradition since lorenzo medici right exactly of yeah. finance <laughs> so, yes of course now my last question i know you have to run but I, my last question is actually about luxury and fashion uh, what do you have anything in your portfolio that is an emblematic big story in that space? It's the space that I have huge interest in. I did one of the first internet fashion companies in 1999, so it's a long time ago. But uh, but it's an area that I have a lot of interest in. Yeah, on the fashion side, we have this amazing company called Velasca. They started. They did first the, the most interesting thing. This is an omni-channel company so it's uh, let's say they started as a shoes e-commerce and shoes going from men to women with a sort of you know luxury uh, positioning um, at the moment we are diversifying to let's say also clothing and other accessories uh, the company really started from scratch from from zero and the interesting thing is now the company doing both online and offline so we mm -hmm. have uh, uh, shops, even in New, New York, London. Uh, we have more than 20 shops in Italy, but they're also selling 50% online. So we are using the two channels as uh, you know, amplifiers on, of themselves. So uh, the brand is very, let's say, very well positioned at the moment in the market. So you can buy online or you can even go to the, to the single shop. And uh, I would say, in my opinion, given, again, the company is around 20 million euro revenue, so it's quite, let's say, large, selling uh, in Italy international, in my opinion, can become a really iconic brand um, in terms of luxury and fashion. Well, this, I think, is a huge opportunity for Italy, given the expertise that exists in Italy on luxury and fashion. Uh, internet first brands, you know, you start on the internet with e-commerce and then you set up shops and, and really build luxury brands or just fashion brands. Doesn't also doesn't have to be pure luxury. It can be yeah. positioned in all kinds of uh, sex, you know, segments of the fashion industry Great. or consumer industry. There's a tremendous opportunity for Italy to play in that because just because of the raw expertise that exists in Italy on this front. Wonderful. It's a great conversation. I, I love um, what you have to say, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see what's happening in Italy. I love Italy. We enjoy Italy very, very much. So uh, it's great to see the movements in the ecosystem. Thank you for Thank coming you, today. Shabana.
Have a good Take day. Care. Okay. Folks, uh, we are going to go straight into talking about 1 million by 1 million very quickly and wrap up the session today. Um, all resources from 1M by 1M are available at 1M by 1M.com. Um, you can find a terrific blog that you can learn from, and you will find a tremendous amount of content that you can find inspiration and education through. Um, the Entrepreneur Journey's book series is another set of learning material that you can look into. They're all case study based books. There are a dozen of them. And these roundtables happen every week. We are approaching 600 roundtables now. Um, the full acceleration program is 1M by 1M Premium. You're very welcome to join and you will get full methodology guidance, curriculum, business development help, and strategy consulting help. The self-assessment is a free tool available on the website. I suggest you run your startup through this self-assessment because these are the VC due diligence questions. Uh, do the bootstrapping course on our website. You'll see it on the blog pinned to the top. It's about a one-hour course that explains to you how the industry works and how we work. Um, Another set of learning material is available on Udemy. We have uh, more than 30 courses available on Udemy. You can start with those, very, very reasonably priced. Or you can join 1M by 1M Basic, which is our curriculum only option. Anyway, look at the website, decide whether you want to do premium, basic, which one suits you, Udemy, wherever you want to start is fine. There are lots of FAQs and video FAQs. The curriculum is described in great detail. We are a case study-based program. One of the great um, differentiators in 1M by 1M is our immense focus on case studies and how people have done it before you so that you can learn from other people who have already done it. We do make a lot of investor introductions. Uh, you will find our investor introduction policy on the website. And our philosophy is do not go to investors as beggars, go as kings. So bootstrap first, raise money later is the mantra. That is all. Uh, we have five more roundtables uh, in the next five weeks before Thanksgiving. So you're very welcome to use any of those to come and talk to me. Um, that is all we have in terms of programming for today. Please uh, feel free to ask your questions. And in the meantime, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about the program, Irina is your contact. You can ask me questions in public chat. You can type in your questions and I'll answer those questions uh, if you like. Anybody, questions? No questions. I don't see any hand up, so in that case, I'm not going to keep you. Uh, let's just move on, and I will see you next week at the roundtable. Okay? Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.